good morning. It's at least morning for me. I have literally just woken up. As you can tell, I have quite tired eyes, but I am cracking on with today, getting this YouTube uh, video out there, even though I have like a hundred uni deadlines, but oh well. Today's video is the unsolved disappearance of Dorothy Jane Scott. If you enjoyed today's video, make sure you subscribe. We have 338 people now that have subscribed. Last video that I posted last week, we only 330. So eight people have subscribed since then. So I'm so happy, thank you. Um, and also some people have DM'd me about they didn't realize that I posted a video. Make sure you hit the notification button and uh, like the notification bell. I don't usually tell people to do that because it's like, you know, subscribe if you want, like if you want. I don't wanna be like, do it. But yeah, if you never wanna miss a video, just make sure you hit the notification bell and it looks like this, so enjoy. But yes, stay safe out there guys and I really hope you enjoyed today's video and I hope to see you in my next couple of videos. Dorothy Jane Scott was born on April 23rd, 1948 to Jacob and Vera Scott in Anaheim, California. In 1976, Dorothy gave birth to a son named Sean. Sean's dad was not really in the picture and he lived some 2,000 miles away in Missouri. Dorothy and Sean lived about 20 minutes from Anaheim in Stanton, California with Dorothy's aunt. While close to her family, Dorothy was very self-reliant. She worked as a backroom secretary for two stores. It was the Swingers Psych Shop and Custom John's Head Shop. These stores catered to the hippie culture in Anaheim, California. Dorothy's parents, Jacob and Vera Scott, lived close to Dorothy's workplaces, meaning Dorothy could leave Sean with them while she worked. Jacob was also a co-owner of Swingers. At work, Dorothy was known by her co-workers as dependable and organized. Her friends and family described her as a great mom, a caring friend, and deeply committed to her Christian faith. She did not do drugs or go out drinking. She preferred to stay at home and spend time with her son and go to church. In the early part of 1980, Dorothy began receiving strange phone calls from an unknown man at her aunt's home. This man professed his love for Dorothy. However, on other occasions, he would spew hating threats. For one example, he, during one phone call, he told Dorothy that he would dismember her so no one would ever find her. In addition, he knew the initial details of Dorothy's daily life and could even describe for her what she was wearing that day. Even more disturbing, during one of the calls, he told Dorothy to go outside and check her car. When Dorothy did, she found a dead rose on her windshield. She told friends and family that the caller's voice was familiar, but she just couldn't figure out who it was or how she knew it was familiar. These phone calls were so disturbing that Dorothy began taking karate classes and considered buying a gun. On May 28, 1980, Dorothy dropped Sean off at her parents' home and went to work as usual. There was a staff meeting at Swingers that evening at 9 p.m., so Dorothy told her parents that she would be picking Sean up a little bit later than usual. During the staff meeting, Dorothy noticed that one of her co-workers, Conrad Bostron, wasn't looking well. There was also this red swelling on his arm that clearly needed medical attention. Concerned, Dorothy and another co-worker, Pam Head, offered to drive Conrad to the hospital. There were no cell phones in those days, so Dorothy decided to stop by her parents' home to tell them that she was taking Conrad to the hospital and did not know exactly when she would be home to pick up Sean. While at her parents' house, she replaced the black scarf that she was wearing with a red one. This becomes an important factor later on. The three then drove down to UC Irvine Medical Center. Whilst Conrad was being treated, Pam and Dorothy waited in the emergency room lobby. The doctors determined that Conrad suffered from a black widow biter bite and prescribed him medicine. Thank goodness Dorothy took him to the hospital as symptoms are usually mild and stop within a few days. However, severe symptoms can last several days and it can damage your muscles, nerves, or organs. And these bites can be fatal in young children. At around 11 p.m., 
Pam and Conrad went to fill the prescription. Dorothy went to the bathroom, then told the other two she would go get the car from the car park and pull up in front of the hospital, as Conrad was still very ill and she didn't want him to have to walk. This would be the last time anyone would ever see Dorothy alive. Pam and Conrad filled his prescription and waited at the hospital entrance. When they didn't see Dorothy, after a few minutes, they went out to the ER's parking lot. They saw Dorothy's car, a white 1973 Toyota station wagon, coming towards them. However, the headlights were on full beam and blindingly bright, and the car did not look as though it was going to stop. They waved their arms, but the car just kept going. The car ended up speeding past them so quickly, they had no time to even try and glimpse to see who's driving. Initially, Pam and Conrad just thought Dorothy had an emergency come up, maybe with her son. So Pam and Conrad stayed at the hospital for two hours, waiting to see if Dorothy might return for them. She never did. They called her parents from the phone in the hospital, asking if she had ever come home to pick Sean up. To which they replied she had not. Unsure of what else to do, Pam and Conrad called the police to report Dorothy missing. Given that she was an adult, they did not seem overly concerned. Not long after, at 4.30 a.m. on May 29th, about five hours since Dorothy was last seen, her 1973 Toyota station wagon was found burning in an alleyway. The car was found in the city of Santa Ana, about 10 miles away from the hospital. Dorothy, nor her kidnapper, was nowhere to be seen. The phone calls from Dorothy's stalker did not stop after she disappeared. The first call was made to Jacob and Vera's Scott's home, about a week after Dorothy disappeared. Vera was home alone. The caller said, Are you related to Dorothy Scott? Yes, Vera replied. The caller replied by saying, I've got her, and then he abruptly hung up. The authorities had been searching for Dorothy, but so far nothing had brought them any closer to finding out what had happened. The phone call was the first clue they got in the case, but pursuing it immediately proved fruitless. Vera and Jacob were told not to go to the media about Dorothy's disappearance, as it could negatively impact the investigation. However, after a week of searching and no progress being made, Jacob gave up waiting and called the Orange County Register about his daughter's disappearance. The paper ran a story about Dorothy and the circumstances surrounding her disappearance. Clearly keeping a close eye on the news regarding Dorothy's disappearance, the unknown caller got on the phone with the editor of the newspaper, Pat Riley, and said to him, I killed her. I killed Dorothy Scott. She was my love. I caught her cheating with another man. She denied having someone else. I killed her. The caller also detailed certain pieces of information that only someone who was involved in her disappearance would know. For example, that she was wearing a red scarf the evening that she disappeared. The unknown man also knew that Dorothy had changed her scarves and that the man that she was with that night, Conrad, was being treated for a spider bite. The phone call to Pat Riley baffled Dorothy's family and friends. They told the authorities they had no knowledge of Dorothy having a boyfriend, let alone time for one, with her two jobs and her son to look after. She also lived with her aunt and mostly spent time with her son when she arrived home. I feel like her family would know if she was having a man round at her aunt's house simply just because her aunt would be there and also her son might be there. And furthermore, I think they would know when she's out because someone would need to be looking after Sean. The caller also told Pat Riley that Dorothy had called him from the hospital. However, Pam Head said that Dorothy never left her side whilst they were there. However, I wouldn't totally rule this out. I'm not saying that Dorothy did call the unknown caller, but it's not impossible, especially if Dorothy quickly nipped to the toilet or she could have called the unknown caller when Pam nipped to the toilet. Months went by, eventually turning into years. During this time, the unknown caller never stopped taunting the family. Nearly every Wednesday afternoon for four years, he would call the Scots home, taunting them saying, Is Dorothy home? 
and that he had Dorothy or he had killed her. He knew Vera and Jacob's routine and only called when Vera was home alone. One time, he slipped up and called in the evening. This time, Jacob Scott answered the phone. The phone calls had ended for now. The police installed a voice recorder at the Scott residence. The police tried to trace the calls, however, the man never stayed on the line long enough. The case went cold. Then, on August 6, 1984, four years after Dorothy's disappearance, construction workers found her body. It was located 30 feet off of Santa Ana Canyon Road. Only her pelvis, skull, and two thigh bones and an arm were found. Also located at the scene was Dorothy's watch and ring. The watch had stopped at 12.29 a.m. on May 29th. That was about an hour after Pam and Conrad last saw Scott's vehicle. Dorothy Scott was identified through dental records, and an autopsy could not determine her cause of death. Now, the really odd thing about where Dorothy was buried was that there was animal bones belonging to a dog on top of her bones. I personally believe that that is not a coincidence. I think the bones were there on purpose. The first thing that comes to my mind was that Killer definitely put the bones there to either throw off police or to confuse the person slash police that found the bones because it would take them longer to be like, is this just animal bones or is it human bones? That's my personal opinion, but I'm not sure. Also, both sets of bones were charred. Police speculated that the bones were charred because there was a bushfire in the same area two years earlier. A newspaper ran an article about the discovery of Dorothy's body. Afterward, Vera received another strange phone call. The caller asked, is Dorothy home? And then hung up. The discovery of the remains brought about a sense of relief amongst Dorothy's family and friends, coupled with an overwhelming sadness that she was really gone. On August 22nd, there was a memorial service held to celebrate Dorothy's life. Possible suspects and theories around Dorothy Scott's disappearance and murder. So many people first suspected that maybe it was Sean's father, Dennis Terry. However, he lived a thousand plus miles away and he had an airtight alibi, so it definitely was not him. Over the years, there has been no conclusive breakthroughs. But many people believe it could have been a man named Mike Butler. He was a brother of a female associate who worked alongside Dorothy. Now, this is just alleged, but according to acquaintances, Butler had an unhealthy obsession with Dorothy. And apparently he was quite an unstable individual who lived in the San Diego mountains and was involved in cult activity. This is why so many people think the dog bones were related to Mike Butler and cult activity. However, there is hardly any evidence to consider Mike Butler a suspect, and the family in general has tried separating themselves from this entire ordeal. And since then, Mike Butler has passed away from health complications in 2014. So even if he did know something, we'll never know now. Some people suspect that the abduction and murder was the act of the Golden State Killer. I did a video on the Golden State Killer if you want to know more information about his crimes. In my opinion, I don't think the Golden State Killer did this just because the way Dorothy was abducted and murdered just isn't similar to the way the Golden State Killer killed his victims. The only similarity is the phone calls. On April 23rd, 1994, Dorothy's birthday... Jacob, Dorothy's dad, passed away at 69 years old. Eight years later, in 2002, her mother would also pass away. They never received any justice or answers to who, why, and how their daughter died. Dorothy's son has gone on to live a meaningful life and apparently still pursues justice for his mother. In 2021, it will be 41 years ago since Dorothy went missing and it has been unsolved ever since. As always, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. I'm sorry for being one day late on posting. It's just all these uni deadlines, but thank you so much. Stay safe out there, guys, and I hope to see you in many more videos.